You know how, how much time Johnny Cash spent in jail? No. None. He don't, never was in jail. Really? Yeah. Oh, you Johnny think that? Huh? No. no, he wasn't in jail. <laughs> he performed a lot in jail. Oh, yeah. But he was never a prisoner in jail. Um, this message today is, okay. is going to be pretty intense. All right. And so I don't want to screw around anymore because oh, yeah. we're on the air. I know we are. Merry Christmas. Week before Christmas, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for those of you who came out to be here live in the studio audience with us. Appreciate that. And thanks for all of you who are tuning in at home. Um, uh, we welcome you all here. And uh, let's start things off with a word of prayer. You don't mind, Charlie? Thank you, Pastor John. It's dearest Father. It's our Father, Abba Father, and Avi, my Father. We thank you that you love us, and you love us unconditionally in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For there was love all around us, but we never heard it, we never saw it, we never experienced it until Christ Jesus came into our lives. For he was the God-man who came to save the sinners, the obdurate sinners, the unrepentant ones. That's what we were. And we thank you, Father, that you shine the light in our hearts so that we could accept his sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection as our own sacrifice. And so with him we are now united and we are now a new creation. And Father, you are our God and we are your people. And you are our Father and we are your sons and daughters. We are always and forever united to Christ, and we share in his inheritance. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Amen, and thank you, Charlie. We're going to continue on the thought that Charlie just brought forth in his prayer. Okay, where do I start? We start here. Um, God came to us. The approach. He came to seek and to save. In the garden, remember? Adam, where are you? Adam and Eve were hiding. God approaches man, man hides in the bushes. It's been going on since sin entered the world. So can you say that hiding is rejecting him? Yeah, sure you can. Does man ever approach God of his own volition? According to the Bible, no. Not one. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, verse 11. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. God's the one doing the seeking, folks. We're the ones doing the rejecting. Even those who say they're seeking God. They're rejecting Christ and they're seeking all the other gods. For the most part. Now I'll give you that. There's an empty spot inside of every heart. It can only be filled by Christ. So they might be seeking, but they're seeking in all the wrong places. Why is it the last place they go is the Bible? The last place they go is church. Man cannot avoid... Approaching or standing before God, God is the inevitable. Well, that inevitable, ultimate encounter, what will be the outcome of that? Man approaches God. It's going to be either God accepting or God rejecting. When God shows up, it's either man accepting 
or man rejecting. When man shows up in God's presence, it's either going to be God accepting or God rejecting, depending upon whose righteousness you're standing in. He came in the garden and was rejected. He came to earth in Bethlehem and was rejected. Isaiah 53, verse 3, he writes, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. I think we can all relate to rejecting him. I know I made an art form out of it for my early years, until I was 20 or so, playing dodgeball with God, trying to deny him that he even existed, trying to shunt my conscience, trying to justify my own actions, make it appear righteous, whitewashing myself. What does receiving him look like? I'm going to read from John 7, 37 and 38. If any man thirst, I've got news for you. Every man thirsts. Because there's no life outside of Christ. If any man thirst. Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I was looking up what scripture that was, as the scripture says. There's about three easy ones that you could find. He was referring to collectively. Moses hit the rock and the water flowed out. Gives us a stony heart. Takes a stony heart, gives us a heart of flesh. Now I want to turn to um, excerpt from a book that I hope most of you know and love by this point in time, Michael Heiser's The Unseen Realm. I hope you have a well-worn copy of this book. If you don't, what are you waiting for? Um, let's begin with Adam. I'm going to read selectively from this part of the unseen realm. The obvious description of his role, of Adam's role, and his identity is the first man. Let's look at Adam more closely. How is Adam being cast in the biblical story? Some other ways of thinking about Adam present themselves. Adam was the son of God. Now, when I was reading from my notes myself earlier, um, how does receiving him look? John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. I think a lot of us scoot right past that. What does that even mean? Well, Michael Heiser is bringing out some things that are going to blow your mind this morning when you see it and from the larger picture. Adam was the son of God. God was his father. And now as son of God, the king, 
the ultimate king. God is the ultimate king of everything. So as the son of the king, Adam was royalty. He was his father's designator, designated ruler in the Garden of Eden. He was also put in the garden to work the land. Once expelled from the garden, as we know that happened, he was displaced from God's kingdom to suffer. Working the garden became difficult. Adam almost lost, or excuse me, not almost, Adam lost his earthly immortality. He died. But the scripture is careful to note, pay very close attention, via the genealogies that his, Adam, his lineage lived on. Most precariously through Noah, all the way to Abraham, and then to Israel. And finally, to Jesus. Read that again for those who just walked in. Once expelled from the garden, Adam was displaced from God's kingdom to suffer. Working in the garden became difficult drudgery. Adam lost his earthly mortality. He died. But the scripture is careful to note the genealogies that his lineage lived on, most precariously through Noah, all the way to Abraham, and then Israel, and then finally to Jesus. Adam, the son of God, the son of the king, therefore royalty, lived on through his lineage, finally to Jesus. His eternal life is guaranteed by God's power, but his bodily return to the new Eden depends on the resurrection of Christ, as it does for all of us. Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Let me remind you, Colossians 1.18. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And also, the first part of Revelation 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the begotten of the dead. Adam's resurrection is contingent upon Christ's resurrection. So we just learned about Adam, that he's the son of God. He's the ruler, the king in God's, um, God's place, ruling in his place in Garden of Eden. He's a servant, serving him. Because of sin, he suffers the effects of sin, and he's exiled, and he dies. He ceases to exist on earth. But he lives on through his descendants, contingent upon the resurrection of Christ. Now let's think about Israel. In terms of descent, Israelites trace their heritage back to Adam. Closer examination of the story of the nation produces remarkable similarities to Adam's profile and calls the nation his son. Let's take a look. Exodus 4, 22-23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son even my firstborn, and I will say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Hosea 11.1, 1. when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Israel is not only the light to the nations, as we read in Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. Israel, a light 
to the nations that are serving false gods. Hmm. Also, 49, verse 6. Isaiah, 49, verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee a light for the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. But God intended Israel to rule over the nations, the Gentiles that are serving the false gods. Psalm 22, or did I get that? Psalm, no, 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 Deuteronomy 15, 6. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Deuteronomy 26, 19. And to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. And also, 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass... If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command me this day, command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee high above all nations of the earth. Then we see Paul says, Romans 4.13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. This only makes sense given that God is ruler of the nations, Psalm 22, 28, for the, the, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Israel, his son, royalty. This vision, of course, will be tied to the messianic heir of David. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Psalm eighty-nine twenty-seven. Also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Israel corporately is referred to as God's servant. We see in Isaiah, where are we, 48, 8 through 9. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. 44, uh, 1 and 2, still in Isaiah. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from thy womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Mm. 44, verse 21. Remember, these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. 
in Isaiah 49, 3, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Keep up with me. Michael Heiser is painting us a picture here. Goes throughout the whole, all of the scriptures. Like Adam, Israel's transgressions lead to exile from the place where the divine presence resided. In Adam's case, the divine presence resided in Eden, and he was ex exiled to not Eden. Now, in Isaiah 2.6, if anybody wants a copy of these notes, the boys in the tape room can make a copy for you because I gave them a printed copy. It has all the scriptures. It doesn't have my notes, just the scriptures. Um, Isaiah 2, 6 through 8. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, <coughs> because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves in the children of strangers. And their land is also full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, which is a symbol of war. Uh, neither is there any end of their chariots, symbol of war. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Ezekiel 7, 9. And mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And, uh, you, shall, and uh, you shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. And then Jeremiah 13, 10. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. They're pictures of how God was dealing with their sin. They're exiled from his presence. They've lost favor with him. The result is suffering many times over under foreign powers and wicked kings. Eventually, Israel is exiled, and ceases to exist as a nation. But the prophets foretold of Israel's resurrection, most vividly through the vision of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. The nation is reborn after the exile in the form of the returning inhabitants of Judah from Babylon. Israel's profile looks familiar. Go over Adams. He's the son of God. Um, he's the ruler king, governing in God's place. He's the servant of God. He suffers the effects of sin. He's exiled, ultimately dies. He lives on with God through the descendants, contingent upon the resurrection. Israel, son of God. Israel, highest among nations. Ruler king, highest among nations. Servant. Suffers the effects of sin. Exile and death ceases to exist on earth. Lives on through Judah. Contingent upon the resurrection. Next, Moses. Son of Abraham. And therefore, son of God. He's a believing Israelite. He was a son of Abraham. As all Israelites would be. But I'll say that. Our father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's read Romans 11. Excuse me, one, Romans 4, 11 and 12. Re re regarding Moses. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised.
Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Faith is believing. It gets you out of the way. If faith is what you believe, not what you do. You always screw it up. But believe the right things, and the right things will happen. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace a gift of God working in you on your behalf because he loves you. Not because you're guilty and you feel you have to obey him. That it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only that which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, because it's by believing that we get into the program. Galatians 3, 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And in 23 and through 29 of Galatians, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law brings you to your knees. Faith brings you to the resurrection. Verse 25, but after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Regarding Moses, his status in that regard was special since he was God's appointed deliverer ruler of the nation. Curiously, Yahweh tells him that he will be as God or as a God or Elohim to Pharaoh and to Moses' brother Aaron. Um, we read that, Exodus 4, 16. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. He's going to speak for God. And thou shalt be to him instead of God, to Aaron. Exodus um, 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. And Aaron, thy brother, shall be thy prophet. It would be through Moses, of course, that God's signs and wonders would be wielded against Egypt as a leader through whom flowed divine power. He would naturally come to be seen by the Israelites as a quasi-divine figure though he was just a man. Moses is called the servant of God, Exodus 14, 31. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant, Moses. Numbers 12, 7. Excuse me, Numbers 12, 6 through 7. And he said, Now hear my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. And in 34, 4 through 6, well, no, 34, 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. 
though God permits him to see the promised land from a distance before his death. Um, the transfiguration, Matthew 17, 1 through 4. Um, and that's, let's see, let me read that. Um, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them unto a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here, <laughs> I'll say. If thou wilt um, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, this informs us that Moses lived on with God. But as with everyone else, his resurrection into a new Eden was contingent upon the one who was to come. So now we can add Moses to this table. Moses, uh, Israel, and Adam, son of God. Same thing, Moses, Israel, Adam. Ruler, king, or highest among the nations with, with Israel. Ruler, king for God's people, Moses. Adam, servant, Israel, servant, Moses, servant. Adam suffers, Israel suffers, Moses suffers. Adam Exile and death, Israel. Exile and death, Moses. Exile and death. Adam lives on with God and through his descendants, contingent upon the resurrection. Israel lives on through Judah, resurrection contingent. Moses lives on with God, resurrection is contingent. Now we come to Israel's king. Recall that God had promised David an everlasting dynastic succession in what we now call the Davidic covenant. The fulfillment of this promise would fail in the Old Testament era due to the death of Israel in exile. But Israel's resurrection through Judah, the tribe of David, would keep the promise alive. As we'll see in more detail later, the fulfillment of the promise would be inaugurated at the first coming of Jesus, Yahweh incarnate. The consummation of the promise is yet future. For our purposes here, how do patterns, how do the patterns emerge in Israelite Davidic kingship and the messianic son of David? Like Moses, and all believing Israelites, David was an earthly son of Yahweh. But we learn from certain psalms that the kings of David's line were also called sons of God in an act of anointed adoption specific to the enthroned king. The king was Yahweh's anointed, anointed descendant of Judah, his ruling representative among all his earthly children. As with Moses, the kingship, by virtue of his adoptive language, carried with it a quasi-divine aspect. Psalm 89, 27 casts the throne of David as the most high among all the nations. The ultimate son of David was, it was presumed, would be a prophet like unto Moses, not only were Adam, Moses, and Israel corporately God's servant, but King David was Yahweh's servant, as were other godly kings. One particular branch or offshoot from the tribe of Judah and David's line would be the individual servant God would use to bring salvation to Israel. Like the corporate servant Israel, this individual servant would suffer and die, but yet live to see his offspring, a multitude made righteous by his service. The picture of Messiah begins to emerge. 
Adam, son of God. Israel, son of God. Moses, son of God. A king, the Messiah, son of God. Adam, ruler king. He governs in God's place. Israel, the highest among the nations. Israel's king is the most high. Moses, ruler king over God's people. King, Messiah, ruler king, represents David and Israel, ruler over God's people and all nations. Adam, servant, Israel, servant, Moses, servant, king, Messiah, servant, represents Israel, redeems Israel, the failed servant. Adam suffers death, the effects of sin. Israel suffers death, the effects of sin. Moses suffers death, the effects of sin. King Messiah suffers death, the effects of the sin of others, Israel's and all nations. Adam lives on with God and through descendants, the resurrection, of course, dependent, contingent upon Christ. Israel lives on through Judah, resurrection contingent. Moses lives on with God, resurrection contingent. King, Messiah, Jesus, resurrected by the power and plan of God, all who are his from Israel and all nations will rise and rule with him. The identity and purpose of the Messiah are unknowable, from a Bible verse, and even many Bible verses. The profile proceeds along conceptual trajectories that eventually merge into a portrait. And so Jesus' question to the two men on the road to Emmaus makes imminent sense. Was it not necessary that the Christ suffer these things and enter into his glory? Yes, of course it was. It's just hard to see that unless you know what you're looking for. The messianic portrait can only be discerned by assembling a hundred terms, phrases, metaphors, and symbols which themselves take on meaning only when their patterns and convergences are detected. There are a few other pieces to show which Michael goes into in subsequent chapters of The Unseen Realm. Again, I can't recommend the book high enough. So what does receiving him look like? As I said, John 1, 12, as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God to them that believed. Being a son of God should take on a lot more meaning than it once did when you see this pattern from Adam all the way through Moses and Israel, and to Messiah. What kind of footing we're standing on? What does it mean to be in Christ now? What does it mean for Christ to be in us now? What does it mean for you to be the light of the world? A light to the blind, a light to the, the godless nations, a light to those that are worshiping the dark angels. Well, what does Paul say? I've been going over it in the Honey on the Slate. And he says, this one thing. This one thing that I do, forgetting the things that are behind, pressing forth. He says, at that point, when you understand Paul's position on this, we're standing between Rejection and receiving him. We've all rejected him. And thank God, those of us who are believers have received him. We know what it's like to, to reject him. He was a man of sorrows. He, was, he knows what it was like to be rejected. Now we know what it's like to be rejected. When we try to be the light of the world, we go out there and we get all the blowback. But we are standing between rejection and reception. Paul says, I press toward 
the mark for the prize of the calling on high. That is what is before us. God came to seek and to save. Adam, where are you? Christ comes. He's standing before us. He's the light showing us the way. We're pressing into him. We're forgetting those things that are behind, constantly being reminded of the things that are behind by our flesh. We're pressing into him. We're not looking at the wind and the waves to the left and the right. We're not double-minded. We're single-focused on pressing into him for the, pri for the mark of the prize of the high calling. Have we received the prize? Not yet. That's going to happen. But we're still in Cronoville. And while we're here, as this play is still unfolding, with us playing a crucial part in the lives of those people who are yet in darkness, we press in. We forget the things that are behind. That's what now looks like. That's what the present moment looks like. Standing before Christ, pressing in, single focus. Your orientation is toward him. Your back turned from what was in Adam. Fully facing Christ, who is our life. Colossians 3, 4. And, I might add, holding forth the word of life. This is the grace in which we stand, as Paul said in Romans 5. Get used to it, folks. It's this all the way through until the end. You're the light of the world now. You actually have the light in you. You have the light in you. You know, some teaching is that, that we're beholding him and so it's reflecting off of us. Well, that's nice. And I can see that's a humble position to take, and that is true. But it's a higher point to take, that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's, been one, it's one thing to be put into the church. It's another thing for Christ to return, pour his spirit out, and fill you with his spirit. You're the light of the world. Don't be like the world. Come out from among them. Be different. Be ye holy. Press in. Be single focused. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the other stuff that you want to worry about or think about or do about, God already knows. <laughs> Come on. Don't worry about stuff. God's got all of that. He says he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. You can have a nice Christmas with your friends. You can do whatever you want to do. You, you know, you're free. But in your freedom... You're carrying around the power of God. You're carrying around in your mouth, in your heart. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the mercy of God. That's the grace of God. That's whatever anybody who has a need needs, you have an answer for them, for any need. I don't care what it is. I don't care if, if, if it's money that they need. I don't care if it's healing that they need. I don't care if it's salvation that they need. All of those things are in Christ. You have what they need. Don't shrink back from that. God came to seek and to save those who are lost. That should be the first order of business when you get out of bed in the morning. Seeking to save those who are lost. That's the heart of God. Get out there and love them. Get out there and show them how it works. Stay cool. Be loving. Be kind. Be a good listener. And be ready to answer any man of the hope of the calling that you have in you. Read your Bibles. That'll help. We got a couple of more slates this year. Those of you who follow, I know most of you do. Um, 
I mentioned that uh, we're not canceling any of the slates because of the holidays, because it doesn't really interfere with any of them. And I suggested that we might want to have a Q&A. We'll push pause on Philippians. We'll have a Q&A. So I asked people what they thought of that, and nobody said anything. I was like, okay. So I, thought, well, I wonder if that was a good idea or not. So I'd like to hear from you. Maybe afterwards you can talk to me and if you had any ideas. You don't have to ask a question online. You can just text me a question if you have any questions. I hope all of you are curious enough to have a question here or there. Nothing wrong with asking questions. And then we can tackle those together. Now, if, if nobody steps up with asking some questions, I'm going to ask some questions of myself. And I'll show you how I go about trying to unpack and find answers to some questions, some of the difficult questions. But I hope you'll still tune in, even though we're not going to finish Philippians until next year. Um, and then also, next week, we're having church. It'll be Christmas Eve. And um, I, I know not everybody can make it. Some people do Christmas morning on Christmas Eve. My family, know we had to wait till the very last before we could open any presents. We could not do it on Christmas Eve. Although my sister Lois, it was, it was, I feel so bad for Lois. Her birthday was Christmas Eve. She was born on Christmas Eve. But you know, one thing that worked to her advantage is my parents never wanted her to feel, you know, cheated. Like, oh, well, we'll just give her this present early. You know, we can, we'll call it a birthday present, you know. No, no, they piled on for her birthday on Christmas Eve. But we, we didn't open our presents until Christmas Day. There wasn't even any, you know, begging and pleading. Oh, just one, can we open this one? They No, they wouldn't give in. But I know some of you do. So we have family time Christmas Eve uh, uh, morning, which is fine. But I hope that you'll all want to be here. Um, hopefully, I, I, there's going to be some uh, special music, and I'll have a message. Um, I don't want to uh, go into anything too, you know, deep, recording notes or teaching kinds of stuff in case you want to bring some family members. It will be gospel of grace, you know, uh, friendly for, for those who are not acquainted with the scriptures, if you want to bring some family members. So that's all I got for you this morning. Was it worth coming for that? Did you learn something? Did you see how big the scriptures are, how God is single-purposed on this whole thing? Can you see how God is messaging us through all these things? You don't see the pattern until you begin to put these, these pieces together. The Bible's full of that stuff. So with that, I'm going to dismiss, and, and I hope we'll, you'll all stick around. We can have some, some coffee and some sweet stuff. And, um, so thank you all for coming. See you in a few minutes.